Hi everyone, it's Mr. Hamilton here. This is the second video about proving trigonometric identities. In the first video, I went all over what identities are, why trigonometric identities, some strategies how to prove them, and then proving some basic ones. And so this one's a follow-up to that. If you haven't seen that video already, check it out in the description below. If you have, then join us as we prove these three examples. So for each of the three examples, I'm going to have the useful strategies listed here, along with the eight building blocks that I described in my last video that we can use to prove any of these. And so let's go over the strategies really quickly, and then I'll point out which strategies we're going to use for which one. Specifically here, you can see what we're proving at the bottom. And so let's start reading here. Try, try simplifying the more complicated side first. Here, there's not really a more complicated side, though you could say the left side is. And so we're going to start with that in this case. Number two, express all ratios in terms of sine and cos. We're going to express tan in terms of sine and cos. Number three, use the Pythagorean identities, replacing sine squared theta plus cos squared theta with one, or vice versa, or rearrange that identity and replace it. We're going to do the same thing with the right side, one minus cos squared theta. We're going to rearrange that and see what that's also equal to in terms of that Pythagorean identity. Number four, combining the fractions which are added or subtracted by finding a common denominator. We're going to do that in our last example. And then in number five, factoring the expressions, we're going to do that in our second example. So let's dig into this example. So I still have our eight building block identities here that we're going to use. But the question says, prove sine theta, cos theta, tan theta equals one minus cos squared theta. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to separate this in the left side and the right side. The left side of the equation, I'm just going to write out what it is, sine theta, cos theta, tan theta. And then on the right side, I'm going to write this as 1 minus cos squared theta. I haven't changed anything yet. I'm just separating those two sides. I'm not rearranging this. That doesn't prove it necessarily. I'm proving that the one side is equal to the other side. So as we noted earlier, I'm going to go ahead and use a strategy where I'm going to let everything be represented in terms of sine and cosine. And so what you can see immediately, as soon as I do that, I'm using this identity right here. As soon as I do that, what you can see is the cosine in the numerator can cancel out with the cosine there in the denominator. And what I'm left with on the left side is sine squared theta. Sine theta times itself is sine squared theta. On the right side, if I take this identity right here, the Pythagorean identity, the first one there, sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1, if I rearrange that and I get sine squared theta by itself, to bring the cos squared theta over, I have to subtract it from both sides. And so what that means is it becomes 1 minus cos squared theta. So I can replace the 1 minus cos squared theta with sine squared theta. And what do you know? We've already proven that this is true. So there you go. That's the first one. Now, what about restrictions? Don't ever forget to do the restrictions. What about them? Well, it looks at first that there's no restrictions here because everything's in the numerator. But don't forget that tan has a restriction here because tan is sine over cos that's allowed to be zero but that cannot be equal to one over zero or something over zero in other words cos squared theta or cos theta sorry cannot be equal to zero so i can never divide by zero that's not allowed in mathematics so cos theta cannot be zero which means that x over r cannot be zero which means that x cannot be 0. And if I draw my, my grid quickly here, I can see that x can't be 0 here and here. Well, those two angles are at 90 and 270 degrees, which means that theta cannot be 90 or 270 degrees. Those are the only restrictions between 0 and 360 degrees. So notice here, what we need to get the restrictions is we need to say what it is, cos, sine, or tan. In this case, tan allowed us to find cos that can't be zero. Then we determine what of x, y, and r can't be zero. And then we determine what angle cannot be. So there you go. That's the first example. Let's look at the second one now. So you can see the bottom is our second example. And I want to just highlight first what strategies we're going to use here. There's not really a more complicated side, so nothing with one. In terms of number two, expressing all ratios in terms of sine and cos, it's already done. Um, the Pythagorean identities, we might do something with that. Um, combining fractions, which are added or subtracted with a common denominator, not needed. 
So really, this is all really about factoring, and we might have to use number three as well. And so let's go ahead and use those strategies with that example. All right, so the left side is equal to cosine four of theta minus sine fourth of theta. And the right side, keeping the two sides separate like we did before, is cos squared theta minus one. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to focus in on the left side, and that's because I recognize something right away. I recognize that I can write this as cos squared theta squared, cos squared theta squared, and then the I can write this also as sine squared theta squared, right? Something that's squared and then squared again is to the power of four. And so now I can see that this is actually a difference of squares. I have two terms that are squared and they're separated by a minus sign. And so we know that if we have a difference of squares, a squared minus b squared, then that becomes a plus b times a minus b. So let's go ahead and do that. The first term plus the second term, first term minus the second term. So we get cos squared plus sine squared theta. Well, wait a second. I think I know that, right? That's one. And then I have cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. So I can simplify this. Cos squared theta plus sine squared theta. That's the first Pythagorean identity. It's one. And then this is times cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. And so I'm just going to write this out without the multiplication here. I'm going to write this out as cos squared theta minus sine squared theta, because one times anything is just what that is. And so now I'm comparing that to the right side. This is starting to look very close. I've got a cos squared theta, but I need to get rid of the sine squared theta. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write sine squared theta in terms of cos squared theta. So that Pythagorean identity told me that sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1. And if I rearrange that for sine squared theta, that's 1 minus cos squared theta. We use that in our first proof. And so I'm going to replace this instead of going from 1 minus cos to squared to sine squared, like I did in the first example, I'm replacing sine squared with 1 minus cos squared theta. Well, this becomes cos squared theta. And if I apply the negative properly, it's switching the signs of both of the terms. So I get minus 1 plus cos squared theta which means that what I'm going to do here is I'm going to combine these like terms, the cos squared theta. So that's two cos squared thetas that I have, minus one. Hey, that's equal to the right side. I have now proven that identity. Now, in this case, we're looking for restrictions again, like we always do. Are there any restrictions in this case? Remember in the last case, we had a tan in the, in the numerator. There was no denominator, so just a tan. But because tan was sine over cos, the cosine had a restriction. But here we just have cos and sine in the numerators. There are going to be no restrictions on anything here. So there are none um, because we have no denominators. Now you might think here, well, cosine would be equal to x over r. And sine would be equal to y over r. Well, doesn't that mean if I'm looking at the lengths that r can't be 0? Well, what is r? r is the length of the terminal arm. It's the length of the terminal arm. You can't have a terminal arm of length zero. In other words, you're never going to have that as a restriction. So this is just explaining that. This is never zero. And so because it can never be zero, there are no restrictions for this example. Let's have a look at that third and final example. So the third and final example is there at the bottom. Again, our strategies. Try simplifying the more complicated side first. We are going to do that. That is the left side. Express all ratios in terms of sine and cosine. We will do that, but we're actually going to wait. We'll do it, but later. So that is also a strategy we're going to use. Using the Pythagorean identities to replace, um, that will come up, but not sine squared theta plus cos squared theta. That may come up later. Uh, and then combining fractions by finding a common denominator. This is actually the first thing we're going to do. Um, then we'll later look to work on expressing all ratios in terms of sine and cos. And I believe that you're going to see this third thing come in as well, though there may be other ways to do that as well. There will not be any factoring in this, but those are the three strategies we're going to use. So let's do it. So the first thing I'm doing after I write things out 
is I'm going to try to find a lowest common denominator. I want to get what's on the left all together, one denominator. So in order for me to do that, I'm actually going to write this out with a little bit of space here, plus secant theta over cotangent theta. And so to get a common denominator, I'm going to write this out like so. I'm going to actually go ahead and um, write this like this. I'm going to write cotangent theta here over cotangent theta. That's like multiplying by 1, so it's not changing anything. And then over here, I'm going to multiply by cosine theta over cosine theta. It's like multiplying by 1, so it's not changing anything either. So what I'm getting here is I'm going to get cotangent squared theta plus secant theta, secant theta times cosine theta. And that's all over cos times cotangent and cotangent times cos. The order of multiplication doesn't matter. So those are the same thing. So we have cos times cotangent, both operating on the angle. And so now we're going to see if we can do a little bit more with this. I'm going to write this out as cotangent squared theta. And then here I'm recognizing I've got a secant. Well, let's, let's see what that is. That's 1 over cos. And then that's multiplied by cos. And so that means the cosine is going to cancel out, leaving me with that 1 there. And on the denominator, I'm going to have cos theta. And I'm just going to write this out as in terms of sine and cos here as well. And this is going to be cotangent is cos over sine. I'm doing that because I have a cosine there. And so if I can combine the cosines, that will make my life a little easier. Notice I haven't changed the cotangent squared yet. Because anytime we see something squared, we're thinking it might be one of the Pythagorean identities that we have to use. So I'm going to hold on to that cotangent squared theta plus 1 for now. So I'm going to write this out as cotangent squared theta plus 1. And then I'm going to write it as divided by cos squared theta over sine theta. Right? Cos times cos gives me cos squared theta. The reason I'm writing it out like that is it just eliminates the option of having like fractions on top of fractions. It makes it a little easier to see. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to invert and multiply. So what I'm going to recognize here is that one of my identities is that 1 plus cotangent squared theta is equal to cosecant squared theta. And so 1 plus cotangent squared theta is the same as cotangent squared theta plus 1. And so that means I can replace this with cosecant squared theta and then I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal. Well, what's the reciprocal? The reciprocal is sine theta over cos squared theta. Almost there. Cosecant. What's cosecant? Well, that's 1 over cosecant squared is 1 over sine squared theta. And if I multiply that by sine theta over cos squared theta, that sine cancels out with one of those signs. And what I'm left with is 1 over sine theta times 1 over cos squared theta. Now you might think I'm not there yet, but let's go to the right side here and break that down a little bit. Secant is 1 over cosine, so that means it's 1 over cos squared theta times cosecant is 1 over sine, so that's 1 over sine theta. Well, those two things are the same. The order of multiplication doesn't matter. So that is equal to the left side, and we have proven that identity. Now, what do we use? Let's have a quick recap of that. We found a common denominator. That was the first and most important strategy. When we saw that it would be applicable to possibly combining some terms, we changed things into sine or cosine. Took the uh, secant, cotangent, and if we had cosecant, we would also use that to use things in terms of sine, cos, and tan. And then we went ahead and used one of the Pythagorean identities. 1 plus cotangent squared theta equals cosecant squared theta. Then we inverted and, multi and multiplied and eventually got to the point where we showed that they were the same. Last thing to do is the restrictions. The restrictions here, there seem to be a lot of them. Let's look here and see. The first thing is cotangent theta has restrictions. Cotangent theta cannot be 0. And so that is related to the restriction that's in, up here, but it's not having as many restrictions in the numerator as it will in the denominator. Cotangent theta 
is um, x over y. And so what that means is that x can't be 0. And then also, because we can't divide by 0, y can't be 0. Now, in terms of, that's, that's here in the denominator. In terms of up top, the only restriction it would have would be that y couldn't be 0, because you can't divide by 0 there. But in terms of the de denominator, it's going to have those two. Now, what else do we have? Well, we have cos cosine can't be 0. That's over here in the denominator. And so that means that x over r can't be 0. Well, r is never going to be 0. It just means x can't be 0. We'll deal with all this in terms of angles in a minute. What about secant? Well, secant, secant can't be 0. Uh, it's not that that can't be 0. It can't be... Um, can't be equal to 1 over 0. Well, what is secant? Secant is 1 over cosine. Well, that means that cos theta cannot be equal to 0. If I can get my pen to work there, uh, which is the same thing we had up top. So we've dealt with all those restrictions. And then secant squared. Uh, secant is, again, 1 over cosine. Same restriction as cosine. And then cosecant is 1 over sine. And so 1 over sine, if we had cosecant, um, you can see right there, that breaks it down maybe a little better. And so that sine theta cannot be 0. Well, when is sine theta equal to 0? Well, it's when y is equal to 0. So y cannot be 0. Those were both right here in cotangent. So it's all been covered, but we're checking them all. We've checked literally all six of these things to see where those restrictions are. And again, just a quick reminder, the reason we're checking for cotangent and secant is not that the numerator can't be zero, but because they're something over something else. It's the denominator of that numerator that can't be zero. So let's look at what this means. X can't be zero. Well, X can't be zero. It's going to be zero at 90 and 270. Those are the angles where X cannot be zero. X would be equal to zero there. And then at the angles here and here, those would be where y is equal to 0. So what that means here is that the angle cannot be, at least in the diagram, 0, 90, 180, 270, or 360. In other words, every 90 degrees is not allowed. Those are the restrictions for this. For all other angles, this would work. So there you go. Three really good examples. Uh, once you've mastered these, you can apply the strategies you've used to a whole bunch of others. All the best as you continue to prove and learn how to prove trig identities. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks so much.